Hi, everybody. I'm Brandon Selinski, and I'm here to talk to you about trademarks. Um, I'm a, a little bit about me. I'm a shareholder at Whitcomb Selinski. We are a law firm in Denver. Our beer law wing is Beer Law HQ. Um, so you'll see our logo on, on each of these slides. Um, the, the topic that we're going to talk about today, it's trademarks, but more importantly, um, it's it's what to do with trademarks and what not to do with trademarks. Um, so we'll get a, a lay of the land here in a second, but I want a quick plug for the Brewers Guild, Colorado Brewers Guild. It's pint day today. So um, if you're in Colorado, you probably know this already, but make sure you get your pint class and support the Brewers Guild. Um, let me tell you what we're going to do here. So this is our, our roadmap. Um, we're going to talk about what a trademark is, um, what a trademark can do, what it can't do, and uh, the benefits of federal registration. Federal re registration is not something that you have to do, but that's the thing that people talk about when they talk about trademarking something, they're talking about federal registration. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about what that means. Um, the second part of this is why we care. Why do we care about trademarks? What is it about the business of brewing beer and selling beer that trademarks is relevant in? Um, and then lastly, um, this is the sort of what not to do part of it. It's a cautionary tales. Um, the cautionary tales part is, is kind of fun in that it's a little bit more interactive. I'm going to ask you um, whether you think that uh, that there's infringement happening. We'll talk about what that is, and you can you can vote on on whether you think it's uh, an infringing case or not. Um, so let's get started right away here. Um, trademarks. So what is a trademark? A trademark in this industry, it's your name and or your logo. Sometimes it's a combination of the two. It's what identifies you, distinguishes you from other breweries and, in fact, from other beverage producers sometimes. We don't have to get too far into that, but um, it, it allows um, consumers to know who they're purchasing this, this product from or the service from. It's a brand identifier. It, it is how people will remember who you are and what you produce. Um, and uh, we've got some examples here just to kind of drive home the point. So these are, I mean, straight out of a law school trademark class textbook, um, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Kodak, um, New Belgium. I don't know if that's in the textbook, but uh, these are all trademarks. These are all combinations of logos and names. You don't need a combination. As I mentioned, it could be one or the other or both. Um, so when we're talking about trademarks. This is what we're talking about. And the important part here is that um, trademarks are not the same things as, as copyrights. Uh, it's not the same thing as patents. Those are those protect protect different types of intellectual property. And I mention that because I get a lot of calls that, that, from people who say that they want to copyright their their name, and um, I, I I don't want to get too high on my horse, but it's just not the same thing. So we want a, a common language here when we talk about trademarks. Copyrights they protect what's called a, a work of authorship. A work of authorship would be a story. Um, it could be a piece of it could be a painting. Um, really, anything that we think of as a piece of art is going to fall into that copyright realm. And it's not just art, but that's sort of the main thing. It also includes art that would go on your label. So label art is protectable by copyright. And that's one of the reasons I want to mention it now. This uh, presentation isn't really about copyrights, but we're going to see some labels later. And one of the ways that you can protect those labels is by registering them as copyrights. Patents are a different thing altogether. Patents protect basically inventions, improvements on processes and things like that. Um, if you are, if you're creating new ways to brew beer, you might run into a, a patent at some point. But for the most part, we're going to be talking about trademarks and a lesser extent copyrights. Um, how do you get a trademark? Well, you get a trademark by using it. So if you come up with Acme Brewing and you start selling beer under Acme Brewing, that's your trademark. And you have a right to some degree of exclusivity with that, uh, with that name. Um, if you don't register it with the federal government, with the, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, then you're protecting it under state law. State law tends to be not as robust. It's not going to get you the same kind of protection. It's limited by geography. So let's say you open Acme Brewing in Longmont, Colorado, and you only sell beer out of your tap room you're not going to get national exclusivity to that mark. Other people, somebody could open a brewery in Colorado Springs, Acme Brewing, and probably not run afoul of any trademark laws. Um, and if you're only selling beer in Longmont, Colorado, you probably don't care. And that might be as, as far as you get protecting any trademark is just making sure no one else in Longmont, Colorado opens Acme Brewing. However, if your ambitions um, reach over the borders of Longmont, Colorado to the rest of the state, maybe uh, the region or the country, 
then you want to think about uh, what else can you put in place to protect that name and or your logo. Um, the federal registration, on the other hand, is going to give you national protection. And that it's sort of the gold standard. When we talk, as I mentioned, when we talk about trademarking something, we're talking about registering it with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. You want to do that for a number of reasons. You can get all kinds of different protections. You can, there's a presumption that you own it. Uh, there's a presumption, if you're doing it right, that other people are aware that you have the right to that mark. It can get you attorney's fees. It can disgorge profits in certain cases. Um, you know, if you have to sue somebody for infringement. So it's the way to go. And I have on my slide here a couple uh, different things under federal registration. And we're not going to go too deep into how to get these things. That's, I mean, that's a whole other presentation. And I'm happy to talk about that if anybody has questions on, uh, at the end of the presentation. But um, it's important to know that you can go two ways with a, um, a federal registration. You can be using your trademark right now and then fill out the application and register that mark with the, the PTO. Or you can do it in advance. Let's say you've got um, bocce ball brown coming down the pike. You're brewing it now. You want to make sure that it's that you've got the protection in place. You get your foot in the door. You can file what's called an intent to use application. And that way, if while you're while that beer is fermenting, um, your neighbor across the street, uh, another brewery comes out with bocce ball brown. You can say, ah, I got my foot in the door. I'm not using it yet, but um, my rights are better than yours because I, I filled out an intent to use application. And I filed it. So that's really helpful when you are when you're starting up, for example, for the name of your brewery, when you have another beer coming down the pike that you know that you might be investing in that beer. It could be a new flagship or something. You want to make sure that it's available. You want to make sure that it stays available. All right. Uh, and these are some of the benefits of federal registration. As I mentioned, this is the way to go. This is the best protection that you can get. It's not terribly difficult to do. It's not terribly expensive to do. Um, it, it, if anybody has questions at the end about trademark infringement and, and what's involved in that, I'm happy to talk about it. But, um, you know, the, the expensive part of trademarks really is the enforcement part of it or the defense. Getting the trademark is, is usually pretty straightforward. Um, all right. So why do we care? Well, let's look at the numbers. These numbers, I think these are the Brewers Association's most recent numbers. They're the most recent numbers I have. In any event, they do a good job of telling the story that we want to tell here. And that is, you know, why do we care about brand value and uh, trademark value? Um, well, the number of craft breweries from 2008 to, to 2018 um, went from 1,500 to over 7,000. So it went from um, being a more collaborative environment to necessarily being, I don't know, there, there's more drama, I think, in the industry than there was in, in 2008. Um, and that's because there are more breweries. So uh, the, the names that we come up with or that you come up with, they have to stretch a little further now. Same with, um, with the production. So 2008, eight and a half million barrels. Uh, 2018, 25 and a half million barrels. That's an, a, a dramatic increase. Um, money is the same way. So retail value um, more than tripled in that 10 year period. So there's just, there's more at stake and there is more, there's less space in less shelf space. So we're more concerned about I have consumers being able to identify your beer with your trademark. If there's some confusion about that trademark, you're losing money. So um, important to, to keep that straight. Um, and this is just kind of a summary of that. So on, on defense, you know that every brewery needs a name, every product, every one of your beers needs a name. Um, and the competition, as I mentioned, it, it, it's just getting more, uh, it's getting fiercer. Uh, I hope it's not getting more cutthroat, but you know, you're a better judge of that than I am. Um, and this doesn't mean that just be, just because every beer needs a trademark, uh, pardon me, the opposite, just because every beer needs a name doesn't mean that every beer needs a trademark. Your flagships, if you are going over state lines, things like that, um, if your reach is further or bigger just in general, then it, it's a better idea for you to, to consider getting that thing registered, uh, particularly if it's a name that uh, is important to you and that you're investing heavily in. Um, and then on offense, you want to protect that investment. So if you register the name of your beer, the name of your brewery as a trademark, you want to make sure that you're able to protect it. And you get again, you get the best protection through a, a federal trademark. Um, when you get that, when you send out that cease and desist to somebody, and you can identify that registration number and registration date. Um, there, there's less of a question in the recipient's mind that you mean business. 
you've bothered to get this thing registered. You hired an attorney or you sent out a cease and desist yourself. You mean business and they ought to listen to you. Um, so what do you do in order to get your trademark? For, it's, uh, the three R's are important. Research, register, and review. So your research, th this is part of my secret sauce, not so secret sauce. This is what I do for every one of my clients who wants a search. And I encourage everybody to get a search. So the first thing you do, plug it into Google. And even if you hire an attorney, you still want to make sure that that name at least looks like it's available. Because if you go to an attorney to do a search and it comes back, um, you know, they plug, the attorney plugs it into Google and it turns out that there's already an Acme brewing down the street from you that somehow you didn't know about, bad news for you. You just wasted money on that search. Um, so do a, do a quick search. Do a Google review. If you feel savvy, if you feel sophisticated, you can, you can go on to the PTO's website, their TESS database, that is the trademark office's database. And you can, you can search around in there. I will tell you that it is, uh, no offense, USPTO is super duper clunky and it probably needs an update. So it's not easy to find what you're looking for. Um, there is some art to finding um, conflicts in there, but you know, if you wanna do that, do it. And then once you're ready, I recommend that you hire an attorney. Of course I do, being an attorney, but there are, there are ways that you can trip yourself up that can be unforgiving. And um, again, this, this is not that presentation, but um, it's worth talking about if you're going to file your own trademark, know what you're doing. I mean, do a little bit of, of research on how to do that. All right, so step two is register. Register your trademark. Um, if it goes through, great. If it doesn't go through, you can get some help in trying to push that thing through. But once that thing is registered, um, you know, put that certificate on your wall. Remember that you have that registration and then start reviewing and periodically just plug that name back into Google. That is all you have to do. The PTO has a publication that you can search and see if somebody's trying to register a name like yours, but tend your fences, police that mark, make sure that no one is coming up behind you and trying to steal your mark or borrow it or anything. Um, because you can lose your right to that mark. If somebody is using your, your trademark or something very similar that can weaken your mark and you can, you can actually lose those rights. So make sure that once you get that trademark that you're, you're doing what you need to, to make sure you, you keep it. Um, all right. And this is, this is the heart of this presentation is what not to do. And I've summarized it with just two lines here. We're going to talk more about that. Really, um, don't steal somebody else's mark and don't let somebody steal your mark. That very apparent, that's the uh, TLDR uh, of this whole presentation is don't steal and don't let somebody steal yours. Um, but let's talk about what that means. Um, because this is our cautionary tales part. This is where we talk about what not to do. Um, and I want to give a little bit of a preface here because it, it helps to know what we're talking about when, when, I, when I say somebody's infringing on a trademark. What does that mean that they're infringing? Does it mean that they're using the exact same name spelled exactly the same way? Yes, absolutely that's included, but it's much more broad than that. You could be using a mark um, that is you know, 90% like somebody else's mark. You could be using a mark that is spelled very differently but pronounced the same way. And the standard here, and this is something to keep in mind, just as you're doing anything with trademarks, coming up with a new name, doing research, whatever, the standard is likelihood of consumer confusion. So is, is a consumer going to look at your mark and look at somebody else's mark and be unclear who the source of the goods or services are? So likelihood of confusion, that's what we're talking about when we say um, trademark infringement. Um, and, and again, if you have questions about what infringement really means or if you have specific questions uh, does this infringe on that? We'd love to talk about that at the end of this. Um, so these cautionary tales, these are things that I pulled from the news. None of these are, are my clients. Um, I mean nobody ill will. I, I tried to use beer examples for this particular presentation. Most of these are beer examples. But um, it, it does. Uh, there's a lot of good takeaways from each of these. So there's a lot of good lessons learned. Um, and that, that's why I use these. Um, so let's jump right into it. Um, the very first one, this is, I think if you've ever had an encounter with a trademark, um, trademark infringement, or just talking about trademarks, you've encountered collaboration, not litigation, um, with, pardon, without, collaboration without litigation. This is like, when we talk about, I talk about gold standard, the, um, you know, the registration, the federal registration is the gold standard for trademarks. This is the gold standard for how you deal with infringement. This was amazing. People still talk about this today. Um, breweries, beer lawyers, 
And we all want things to go this well. If we lived in a happy land, this is how things would turn out all the time. So this was Russian River and Avery. They both were selling a beer called Salvation. And they both realized it. And so um, they got together and said, hey, you know, uh, everyone's doing cease and desist letters, but we're better than that. Uh, we're brewing. We are collaborative. Let's be collaborative on this one. And so they, this is what they did. They got together. And my understanding is they, um, they blended their two beers together. And this is that beer, Collaboration Without Litigation. Everyone went home, home happy. It was a good news story. Everything came up Millhouse. I mean, it was, it was perfect. So um, that is one way to go. And this is why I always tell my clients, when you, have, when you get that cease and desist or when you find that somebody's using your mark, you should reach out. I mean, communication can be key and that can, can save you a lot of money. What's the worst they can say? You know, pound sand? They might tell you to pound sand, but at least you tried. And then you can figure out what your next step is. But reach out. Reach out to Acme Brewing and say, hey, we're already Acme Brewing. Would you mind changing your name? And you can sweeten that pot a little bit. You can say, if you change your name, we'll give you 60 days to sell off your stock. Um, we won't do anything to say bad stuff about you. Maybe we'll brew a beer together and it will be called Acme Squared or something. So you can get creative, especially in the brewing world. You can get creative. And this is a great example of that. So the lesson here is if somebody bothers to register a trademark, they're going to enforce their trademark. They're not going to give things away. Um, and in this case, they, they didn't have to worry about that at all. They figured it out without getting to that, that state of acrimony. Um, all right, so next one is Renegade Brewing. They're right here in Denver. They're great. They are my old neighbor. I used to live in the, uh, down the street, a block away from them. Um, and they had a beer called Righteous Rye PA. Great beer. That was their flagship. Um, they, this was, uh, and they sold it. You can see they're selling them 16 ounce um, tall boys. Wonderful beer. However, um, they opened in, Renegade opened in 2011. Um, Six Point Brewing in New York had a, registered trademark on uh, their, their Righteous Barrel Age Rye. Never tried the beer. I don't know anything about it, but they had a registered trademark for it. And so they sent a cease and desist and Re Renegade. Um, again, they used this as a marketing point. They said, hey, somebody's beaten up on us. It's not fair. No one is confusing our beer with their beer. It's not exactly the same name, but okay. We're going to change our, our name and we're going to change, um, change our label to redacted. So now we're redacted. I don't know if it was redacted rye PA. It is redacted rye, India pale ale. And they got some mileage out of that. That was a good way to go. Again, it didn't, it didn't get to the point where there was a lawsuit filed or where they, uh, you know, they had to go to court or pay attorneys. I, I don't think they decided, look, we'll push back a little bit. We'll rebrand and it'll be a lesson learned. Um, and, uh, you know, people will, will hear about our name. So that's great. Um, all right. So, the next one that we have here, this is another one. That these, these first several are these are classic examples of beer trademark um, issues. Uh, and this one I, I like because it was so weird. Uh, in this one, Magic Hat Brewing in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, uh, pardon me. Uh, West Six was in Lexington. Magic Hat, Hat is in Burlington, Vermont. Magic Hat was first. And they've got the, the logo on the right. This is their number nine. Um, West Sixth came out with their... Um, let's see, what did they call this? Um, I can't remember exactly, and it doesn't say that on there. I think it's just that their logo for the brewery. So uh, these look sort of like they're round. They have a number in the middle. They have a thing next to the number. And so, um, it's, you know, right away you're like, well, all right. You know, they have their name around the outside. It's not clear that people, to me, it's not clear that, that people are going to be confused right away. And if you're out there, I'd like to get your opinion on this. So I didn't create a slide for this question, but at this point, if you want to tag in and give me a, a yes or a no, yes, this is infringement or no, this is not infringement. Um, I'd like to know what you think. They never got to the heart of the matter. They didn't go to court on this one. So we didn't get a, a final result or an answer from a court, but they did figure something out. And what they figured out after it, this was, this was weird because this is not a trademark lawsuit, but they did file a lawsuit. So um, Magic Hat filed a lawsuit against West Sixth for um, uh, not for for trademarks, but for the um, the campaign that they launched against them in the social in social media, um, and it is it just basically it was a defamation suit. So um, number let's see, Magic Hat sent a cease and desist to West Sixth. West Sixth said. 
oh, they're, they're persecuting us. Um, this is not fair. It's not the same logo. Uh, Magic Hat came and sued them for defamation. So they resolved it by um, basically, I mean, doing very little. So West, in my opinion, West Sixth said, okay, uh, here, this is what I want to show you right here is um, at the, the bottom two, if you turn the West Six logo upside down, then it becomes clear that it, it is almost exactly the same thing. I mean, the basic elements are exactly the same. The dingbat is what they call the little symbol next to that number nine, um, as opposed to the hashtag in, in um, Magic Hats. So if you turn it upside down, it really is the same thing. So what they said was, all right, we're going to take away that dingbat and we'll put our name around the outside. And that's the solution that, that we're going to go with. And so the lesson here is be careful with your smear campaign. Be careful what you do in social media. Um, it, it's always tempting to go to your, your social media outlets and say that this other brewery, um, they're being big bullies and they're trying to make us stop using this thing. And, and it's nothing like their thing. Um, but, you know, you get sued for that, too, if you're being irresponsible. So be careful with how you approach um, whatever, you know, whatever campaign you, you do for this. Um, all right, so the next one is Wiley Roots. Wiley Roots is also, they're local in that they're from Colorado. Um, they, they came out with the slush beer. Those were big a few years ago. I think this is 2018. And um, it's, a, it's a great beer. Their tribute was to, um, to Sonic. And so there, and I'm going I'm to go back to this one because you can see at the bottom of this slide, you can see the, the Wiley, and it looks like the Sonic logo and the can is set up to have some references uh, to uh, 44, for example. Sonic sells this uh, 40, Route 44 slush, what they I think is like 44 ounces. So you can see the number 44 in there, a couple other things, and they got a cease and desist like, I mean, in the blink of an eye. Um, Sonic sent them a letter that said, stop doing this, you're stealing. Why the Roots said, well, it's really just a tribute, but point taken, and they changed. So they rebranded this thing. Uh, they're slushes, and you can see on the right, this is a side-by-side. -side. So they, they, they kept a lot of the same imagery, but they changed it. Instead of the Route 44, you can see the slush machine in the background. Um, they took away that, that Sonic logo, um, and, and they carried on. So the lesson here, uh, honestly, to me was sometimes you get away with it. Uh, this was a case where they were... In my opinion, my legal opinion, they were definitely infringing on Sonic, and it doesn't matter that they weren't doing it uh, to be, you know, to, to trade on their name. I don't think they were. I think they, they, they genuinely, um, it was a tribute to an iconic brand, but the iconic brand didn't like it, and so they changed it. And no harm, no foul. Again, they got some uh, some publicity out of it, and I think it probably worked out okay for them. I haven't talked to them about it, but um, but this is one that that was okay. The next one, however, actually the next one, they, they kind of got away with it too. But, um, this is a one of my non-beer examples, and I have this because it was recent. And again, there's a good lesson learned here. This was a case where the Cleveland Indians were rebranding uh, through uh, because of a lot of public pressure. So, um, and I think what I want to do actually is I'm just going to read something that is my next slide here. But um, they were rebranding. They came up with the name Guardians. Uh, this refers to the statues that are right near the, the hundred year old statues that are right near the stadium. They call them the guardians of traffic, I think is the full name. And so they were going to change the name of the Cleveland Indians to the Cleveland Guardians. Well, it, it just so happens there already was a Cleveland Guardians and it was a roller derby team. Um, and they, they objected. They, I think they filed, the Cleveland Guardians roller derby team filed their trademark application as soon as they got wind of uh, this rebranding that the Indians were doing. Um, and, you know, you can see that these two logos, they don't look much alike, but this is a good example of it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that they don't look much alike. They're both the Cleveland Guardians and people are likely to be confused, maybe. So it, it doesn't look like anyone out there is responding. I'm just looking over at, at our, my little side panel there. Um, so I won't ask you to, to vote on this one, but, you know, are people going to be confused? Are consumers going to be confused? as to whether they're going to see the Cleveland Guardians baseball team or the Cleveland Guardians roller derby team. Um, maybe not, but there are some, there are enough similarities that they're both sports teams, they're both in Cleveland, they're both called the Guardians. Um, so you could make a case. Um, and I, I think the, the, the lesson on this one is, is best, um, best delivered by Peter Sagal from Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, 
which is a, a comedy show on NPR. It's one of my favorites. And this was a uh, this was trademarks in the news. So um, I got to nerd out on that. But I'm just going to read it right off the, right off the page. The other Cleveland Guardians, which have existed for years, are a roller derby team. They've been around. They have a copyright on the name. That's not true. They don't have a copyright on the name. We talked about that already. It's not a copyright. Um, they own the Cleveland Guardians, not clevelandguardians.com domain name. Uh, so that's right. The baseball team spent years deciding on a new name. They focus grouped it. They created an announcement video. They hired Tom Hanks to narrate it. But to Google the phrase Cleveland Guardians, who's got the time? So the answer to that is you. You have the time. Don't do what the Cleveland Guardians did and uh, pick a name that is clearly already being used out of all the um, you know, infinite number of names they could have come up with. Um, so this is another case of they got away with it because recently, I think it was in November, um, they, the two sides came together. Um, the, I, the Guardians had filed a lawsuit. The roller derby team had filed a lawsuit. Two sides came together and decided they would coexist. They decided that even though the lawsuit um, that the, the the roller derby team filed said, uh, no way can these two um, teams coexist uh, with the same name. Uh, they came together and said, okay, fine. And really, um, so it's a, it's a case of you might be able to get away with it, but it's also a case of sometimes deeper pockets matter. If you are up against a professional baseball team and you are a, I don't know if they're a beer league, but you're a roller derby team, which I think tops out at beer league, uh, you are likely to get out-resourced. Out um, and so it might not be in your best interest to sue them, even though, um, you know, you've got better rights to that mark. Um, all right. And then this next one is my all time favorite case now. And it's, it was in the news just as of last week, this came down. Um, this was fantastic. If you're in craft beer, this is Miller Coors, uh, pardon me, it's a stone brewing versus Miller Coors for anybody out there who doesn't know this was uh, stone brewing has a trademark on their name, Stone Brewing. And I think they have a few different versions uh, of that trademark. Registered trademark with the USPTO. Miller Coors launched an ad campaign um, it, for Keystone. They're, they're, it's one of their brands, Keystone, Keystone Light, as Stone. And uh, their argument was, well, everyone calls our, our beer Stone. Uh, that's just the thing that our consumers do. And they've been calling our beer Stone for a long time. so. We are. We get to use it, and and no one is going to be confused. No one is going to think that they are buying a case of Stone Brewing beer for twelve bucks. Um, so Stone filed suit, and uh, just came down fifty-six million dollar jury verdict. This is one of the few cases that went all the way to the jury. Um, Stone is, you know, I would say probably one of the few breweries that can afford that fight. If in fact they could afford it, I don't know, but um, that certainly cost them a lot of money. And they won, and so it feels good to know that, that when you are able to find to to fund that fight, that you hold a, a a hope of winning, even if it's against a Miller Coors. So sometimes deep pockets matter. Sometimes you're still going to win. Um, and I have a uh, so again, this is you know Stone Brewing versus this is a you know, part of Stone's marketing campaign, obviously. Um, but they um, that, anyway they they won, and, and that felt good. Um, that felt good to the craft brewing community. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide here. All right, and this is another non-beer one, but it was a, it was a label, uh, a, a label thing. So I'm going to try to include some more label art here. Um, this was a, so Danon, which is a, I think a French company, um, started selling a creamer, a coffee creamer that looked a lot like, uh, I think it was a Nestle product. Um, and so again, you know, I'm curious what you think, whether if you saw these two products on the shelf, would you be uncertain as to whether they came from the same place? Uh, you can see there are some elements that are the same. There's a purple stripe at, near the top, uh, near what looks like to be a screw off top. And the shape is similar. There's a flip top. Um, some of the stuff is functional. The flip top, the shape might be functional. I doubt it. But, um, you know, so there's some elements in here that you can see that are very similar. And again, this didn't go to trial. Uh, I think that Dan and finally conceded um, and they stopped selling uh, this version of their, of their product. Um, so there's not really a, a lesson here, just that trademarks extend to labels. If you, if you're with it's with something they call trade dress, that's a, a name a term that I haven't used, but trade dress is what your packaging looks like. So that includes label art, but that also includes 
boxes and, and other kinds of packaging. And you can infringe on somebody's packaging. That's a thing. That's what happened here. So that's why label art, um, that's why we're paying attention to label art also. Um, all right, so this is a, I, I really like this one because again, I, I feel like the right side won on this one. Um, it, in my practice, we represent a lot of small companies. We represent a lot of companies, small and medium and large against the, the government, especially the federal government. And so it's usually our client against some much larger entity. And that's what was, that was the case here. Um, Old Town Brewing is in Portland and they, their, their logo is the, the stag. And you can see this is the, um, in the slide. There's a picture of the sign. This is a big sign in Portland. So Old Town Brewing didn't come up with that stag. It's a reference to a, an iconic thing in Portland, that sign. Um, a lot of people know that sign is, as being in Portland. So they, they use that stag. No problem yet because the city of Portland does not brew beer. So there's really no overlap there. No problem, no infringement. And they had been using that for some period of time. Uh, Old Town had been using it. Um, and then the city of Portland decided that they would sell rights to that sign, which includes the stag. And they sold it to a, a, a macro brewery. They, so a major brewing part, a major brewing company was going to be a partner with the city and they were going to get to use that sign, which includes the stag, which would infringe on Old Town's logo. Um, so says Old Town. Um, and, and, you know, I won't, I won't be shy about it. I think they're right. If another brewery was selling beer uh, or even holding an event where they sold their beer using that sign, that sign is infringing on Old Town. They sold beer under that logo first. They should have better rights to it. So Old Town um, protested and said, hey, we're a business in your town. Why are you undermining us? And it got, I think it got pretty heated, at least it did in the, in the news. Um, and long story short, Old Town, uh, Old Town won. They, the city finally... Um, rescinded that license, or, or maybe they hadn't given the license yet. I don't know. They, they finally took that back. They said, okay, we're going to license this out to a bunch of things, but we are not going to let somebody sell beer under this name. So that's kind of a happy ending. And the lesson here is that industry matters. So you can use this stag to do lots of things, and it's not going to infringe on somebody selling beer under it. Um, and so when you do your searches before you rename a beer or launch your brewery, keep that in mind. It's not just beer that you need to pay attention to. Wineries are also going to be relevant, other beverage companies. Um, these are all things that, uh, you know, it helps to have somebody who knows the lay of the land when you're doing searches, but industry matters. Um, all right, and then this is the, the last one, sort of that you get a, a double feature here. Uh, this is North Coast Brewing. North Coast Brewing sells a... Um, Wonderful beer called Brother Thelonious. It's a, a Belgian ale. And they, this is a true label art double feature. They, they got there. So the, the one on the left is the old label. The one on the right is the new one. The old label, they got the right to, um, the, the artist designed it for them or contracted for them. Maybe, maybe that was not originally meant to be a beer label, but, but um, sold them the rights to it. Sold them the rights to sell beer using that art as their label. The um, the artists um, the, the artist passed away, and his uh, estate um, wound up um, suing North Coast Brewing. So that's the Signorelli. I think that might be the wife. She ended up suing North Coast Brewing because they started using that that label for other things. They were um, launching beer events, and I think putting out on um, uh, shirts and other merch. And the estate said, we, the artist did not give you rights to do that. We gave you rights to sell beer under that name. You're doing a lot more. We're taking it back. You no longer have the right to this. Um, North Coast won. Uh, they won because the artist did not limit, hit, limit the license to just selling beer. There was no record of that. Um, that. The artist had passed away. We couldn't ask him. And there was nothing in writing that says you can only sell beer under this. Um, and so that's the lesson here. The lesson is, I mean, get it in writing. You know, any attorney is going to tell you that over and over again. But also, you know, have that conversation. If you are contracting with somebody to do artwork for you, make it clear about what you can use that artwork for. Because if you're not, um, it's it, at least in this case, the, the takeaway from the court was um, there's not going to be a limit. If there was not a limit included in that agreement, then it's an unlimited license. 
So the second one was um, Monk versus North Coast. Um, it, and I like this because you have the same label, two different lawsuits um, for two different uh, intellectual property concerns. This one was um, Th uh, Thelonious Monk's estate suing North Coast, saying you can't use his image on your beer. Um, it could be four, but we're going to revoke that. Um, this one was a confidential settlement. And so if this didn't go to trial, we don't really know what the outcome would have been. But right after this, right after the, the dismissal of the lawsuit, um, North Coast came out with this other, uh, other label. So they, they changed the label. They still are using his image. And the, uh, the word on the street is they were already in the process of doing that. And um, uh, the, the lawsuit was just a coincidence. But anyway, point being, again, you know, get this in writing. If you have a license in writing to use that likeness, to use that artwork on your labels or on your packaging, um, then that's going to answer these questions. You don't have to spend the money defending a lawsuit, which is incredibly expensive. Um, okay, so that is it. Um, that's it for my presentation. I'm, I'm happy to talk anything else about um, trademarks, uh, about trademarks as they intersect with beer or other things. If you have any questions, um, fire away. Um, if not, I'm going to put my contact info up here. So if you need to get a hold of me, you can email me, brandon at whitcomblawpc.com or brandon at beerlawhq.com. Um, our websites are up there on the slide. So um, I'll give it a second. If anyone's got a, a question, uh, you can write it in the chat. Um, if not, we'll wrap it up here. Um, I, I appreciate you all for attending and uh, for spending time uh, letting me talk to, about trademarks with you. Um, if you have any questions, you can always give me a call. Again, I'm happy to, to talk about trademarks and we'll point you in the right direction if you want to do it yourself. Uh, I'm not jealous about that. I'll, I'll tell you the things to, to look out for and we can have a conversation about that. Uh, when to hire me to do it, I, I do all that stuff. Um, register trademarks, fight trademark infringement battles, um, all that good stuff. So looks like we do not have any questions. So um, say so yeah, happy pint day to everybody in Colorado. And um, have a good one. Take care.